This is episode 111 of the Beyond the Food Show. And today we're talking about reinventing ourselves so we can start fresh. And that is an interview with Jamie Lerner, psychotherapist. My name is Stephanie Doze. I'm a clinical nutritionist. And at 35, I was trapped with severe anxiety, panic attack, obesity, and my health completely collapsed. I needed solution and my journey began. Each episode of the Beyond the Food Show, we bring you an expert or a message to help you achieve your health goal, unlock your self-confidence, and live a better life. This episode of the Beyond the Food Show is brought to you by the Beyond the Food Academy, a learning platform for women who want to understand what's really behind their choices and their food obsession. It is a community and it is a system where you can learn to understand your own behavior that compromise you achieving your goal. The Beyond the Food Academy is how you will move up to the next level of freedom and happiness in your life. You can register for the next session of the Beyond the Food Academy at stephaniedodzie.com slash academy. The next opening is scheduled for February 2018. In today's episode, we're going to talk about reinvention because for those that are listening live, it is the time of the year. It is when people fall into the trap of getting resolution and their new goal for 2018. And I call it a trap because it is a trap because we're focused when we have resolution and most goal setting exercise on outside goal, a new promotion at work, a new car, a bigger home, or maybe even a number on the scale that we want to reach for 2018. And those goals that are focused on the outside are leading us directly to failure. And we know that statistically, that only 10% of New Year resolution actually happen. So what can we do instead? That's what I'm teaching currently to the ladies in the Beyond the Food Academy is we're refocusing ourselves on chasing something inside of us, which is our feeling and our emotion, inside of something outside of us. And that's called chasing feelings and emotion so we can actually sustain our action throughout the whole year. It's a completely different concept, but life-changing. And to support that, the next step is actually to change our own self. And Einstein has a quote, and I don't have the exact quote, but it goes something like this. If you think you're going to achieve different result with the same behavior, you're leading right to failure. Well, it is the same thing here. If you think you're going to achieve those new feelings, emotion, or goal for 2018 while staying the same person, for sure it's going to fail. You have to change yourself from within to have a different choices, different behavior, different attitude. And that's what today's episode is all about, is how we can reinvent ourselves by changing our storyline. Jamie Lerner, the person who collaborated for this interview, is a psychotherapist and the co-author of the book, The Ever-Loving Essence of You. And she's a special therapist because she actually doesn't like to ask people to look back, but actually she's helping them find themselves. And to do that, she's helping them re invent and rewrite their own storyline. And that's what I'm inviting you to do today with me and Jamie. And we're also going to introduce you to the concept of the law of manifestation. Pretty cool concept that will ensure you that you're going to achieve your, and I'm using air quotes right now, your goals for 2018. Now, are you ready? Let's do this. Hello, Jamie. Nice to have you on the show. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk with you today about your perspective on particularly women's relationship to food and how that can lead us through the path of self-love and 
changing ourselves and going with this new perspective on our own life and how it can help us lead and heal our relationship to food. So when we talk relationship to food for you, Jamie, what does that mean? Well, you know, food is a wonderful way for us to nourish our bodies and mealtime is a platform for a lot of social interaction. Mm -hmm. And for some cooking is a hobby or a passion, but as a society, I think we have a lot of confusion around food. So, you know, there are so many conflicting nutritional information about our food choices. And I think we've lost touch with our connection to how we feel about our choices as we make them. And if we were to pause and create harmony between our thoughts and feelings about what we were about to eat and with the food itself, then I believe our bodies would be able to properly and peacefully metabolize our food choices, whatever they may be. So when we clearly and consciously allow ourselves to make food choices based on what feels correct, and when we allow ourselves the pleasure of enjoying our food without conflict, worry, or guilt, then our food becomes a wonderful way to nourish our bodies and our minds. However, when we make food choices, so we think that maybe that is going to make us feel better, I think that's where we have lost our way. So how can we reconnect with ourselves first and feel good before we sit down to eat whatever it is that we're going to eat? And so I think we've kind of mixed it up. I think it's very interesting because the entire weight loss, fitness, food industry is based on the opposite, which is how food can fix our problem if we can control it or appropriately bring it into our body. I believe it's our thoughts that can fix our problem, which I don't even think we have a problem. I just think that we have a distorted relationship with something that is so wonderful, which is food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and food is wonderful. So I think it's how can we recreate this relationship with food? But first of all, how can we recreate the relationship with ourselves so that we are looking at food as a pleasure? is something to accentuate our life instead of this ongoing sense of guilt and anxiety. Because there is a place, and I think we have that in common, both you and I, where I know for me, I see the women that are following me and are working with me in my programs as people that have a very emotional relationship to food. Not to say that emotional relationship to food is quote unquote, bad or shouldn't be happening, because I think it's part of the reason why we have food in our life. But we use it maybe as a way of medicating the emotion that we're not feeling good about. What's your point of view on that? Well, it's interesting, because I think that if we could be consciously creating our connection with ourselves and our food, Mm -hmm. then that would be very helpful to us in the entire eating process. So are we consciously choosing? Are we looking at our food, thinking about our food, enjoying our food, visualizing how this food is supporting us nutritionally and physically? And I think that whole process, that sense of appreciation and connection to food is gone for people. So can we hit the pause button when we are hungry and literally see the food in our mind, literally smell the food, literally almost take ourselves through the entire process of eating the food before we've even eaten it and then make the choice if we still really want it. So how can we enjoy food and the process of enjoying it needs to be a conscious, thoughtful process. So in wanting to heal our relationship to food, what we truly need to do is to change our relationship with ourselves. I believe that would be very helpful. Yes. <laughs> I think that would be. And which is the whole thematic of the last couple episodes and today, which is about how do we reinvent ourselves, but not reinvent ourselves to achieve outside goal. But in this case today, and in the case of most of the listeners, how do we reinvent ourselves so we can have a better relationship to food? 
you know, in some ways, I think it would be wonderful if we could relax into ourselves. Instead of reinventing ourselves, we were all born with a knowing. Mm -hmm. And we tend to move away from that inner knowing, inner guidance, just because life is filled with contrast. But to reconnect with our inner knowing, our inner guidance, I think that intuitively we would be able to relax back into ourselves. And that would be a wonderful way of consciously creating our life. So how do we begin this process from your perspective of relaxing into ourselves so we can get intuitive and self-guided? I think one of the ways would be to quiet the mind chatter. We have all this running kind of dialogue going consciously or unconsciously all the time. And if we could isolate some of those sound bites and understand literally what we are feeding ourselves, what are those internal messages that we are sending to ourselves over and over and over again? And then once we realize what those are, we need to laugh about it because otherwise we would probably be, be devastated <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> once we understood the way that we are speaking to each other probably in such a way that we would never speak to any other person so to kind of like get a handle on that look at it and then laugh about it because 99 percent of it is not even true i know it's the ego eh? It's interesting. And who knows where it comes from and who cares where it comes from. But once you can isolate it and laugh about it, then you can start kind of sifting through it and letting it go, reframing it, reformulating it. And that's, I think, where the reinvention comes in. You know, how can we unpack the language that we have created mostly out of habit and Substitute it with language that's more encouraging, that's more loving, that's more nurturing to ourselves. Because those messages, those thoughts are really running our body. The mind runs the body. So what is the mind feeding the body? And that's what you call the storyline, right? It's not the storyline from the outside coming into us, but it's the storyline we create for ourselves through that chatter in our head. It is. And unfortunately, we tend to create the story that gives us the biggest audience. And society loves drama. So if you are going to tell your story filled with a woe and struggle and hardship, you will have a huge audience. And I think oftentimes we lose sight of our real story because we're so dependent on looking outside of ourselves for that validation from the outside world. So how's that working for you? If the story you're telling is feeling good, great. Keep telling it because it probably feels really good as you're living it. But if the story you're telling yourself and others doesn't feel so good, it probably doesn't feel so good living it. And the beauty of that is that you can change one line of your story or you can change the entire story. I think it's brilliant because... Like you said, most of us, and I was a guilty party in in that as well, we chatter ourselves when we talk to ourselves, A, very negatively, that we would never talk to other people in that way. And we do that, which creates a lot of emotion towards ourselves, which leads us to eat as a way of numbing those emotions. Yes. And it's unfortunate because eating is supposed to be pleasurable. I know. Food is the most loveliest, most wonderful, most beautiful thing that available to us. And we have an abundance of it. So it's unfortunate that we use food as a weapon instead of it's something to nourish ourselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, pop, pop tarts could be nourishing. Donuts are nourishing. Ice cream is nourishing. These are wonderful things to eat. The question is, can you eat them from a place of already feeling good as opposed to eating them to feel good? And that's where the concept of changing our storyline comes in. Yes, we can reframe it. And that would be very helpful. So 
and I've shared this with the audience a few times, and I'm going to reshare it in case you're listening for the first time, but my very first experience with meditation, that concept where I was taught, you know, like you said, Jamie, we need to change our chatter. And the solution to that was meditation. So I think it was January 3rd, five or six years ago, I sat with all my lists of resolution for the year, I'm going to meditate now. And I sat in the second bedroom in my house and with a guided meditation from Deepak Chopra, probably some of you may remember the 21 day challenge he used to do with Oprah Winfrey. And I sat in my room and I listened to this and it was one of the most painful experiences in my life. Because for the first time, I actually was able to listen and observe my own thoughts. And it was very difficult because it was kind of a disc playing in the background that I wasn't aware. And once I realized what was playing in the background, it became very difficult to the point where I couldn't sit in silence for more than two minutes without wanting to get out of my own body and my own observation because it was too painful. How do you approach this process of observing our thoughts and changing the story that's playing in the background from your perspective, Jamie? Laughter, lots and lots of (laughs) laughter. Absolutely, just throwing yourself on the floor and laughing because it's all very funny. Mm -hmm. If you could really stand outside of yourself and listen to this, it's completely ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. It is funny because it's not even true. I know. So I think laughter is a wonderful way of dealing with pretty much everything. And it's not that we're sidestepping the emotional content, but we're using the laughter to deal with the emotional content. And there is something emotionally absurd about these ideas and thoughts that we have created and recreated. And oftentimes, because we've been kind of lazy, we've just dragged all this stuff from God knows where and mixed it all up and taken it on and believed it to be so, and then just continually repeat it. So that in itself is pretty funny. I wish that somebody would have told me that. (laughs) That day that I sat in meditation for the first time and I was traumatized by observing my own thought. I wish you could have been there, Jamie, and tell me to laugh about it because I took it so seriously and I went in the spiral of a mini depression for a couple months because I thought, oh my God, I'm so broken. You know, none of us are broken. And I think that all of these things are just moments. This is not your life. This is a moment in your Mm -hmm. life. And so we can make conscious choices about how we're choosing to feel about each and every moment. Because the only two things that we absolutely have control over is what we're choosing to think about and how we're choosing to feel about what we're choosing to think about. And we have no other choices in this world. I mean, really, we don't have control over other people or circumstances or situations. But once you harness this personal power of taking personal responsibility and moment by moment making choices to, you know, as Abraham would say, reach for the thought that feels better. That's a choice. And that feels really good. And I want to give every single person that's listening to this permission to feel good because you are worthy. You are your own greatest resource. And the whole purpose of this life is to feel joy. And one of the things that many women struggle with, and I know it was a struggle for me as well, is those thoughts that were going in the background, but the judgment that those thoughts were having on situation that had happened in my life before. So very difficult situation in which I was constantly replaying the background song of it and the judgment around it. So how can we go about reframing those difficult situations so we can have that laughter about them instead of constantly judging it and being in pain because of those difficult situations in our life? I think that if we were able to look at what happened to us, whatever that was back then, from our right now perspective, Hmm. then 
we would understand it differently. We would almost understand it with a level of appreciation as opposed to continually looking back and revisiting it as if we were small because we're not small. And if we understand it today, what happened then, we have a completely different understanding from our adult perspective. And I think that that is very helpful. It helps us reframe what happened then and appreciate how we have used it to get to where we are right now. And for most of us, whatever that contrast has been, it really has launched all these desires and we are where we are today because of it. And there is a lot of goodness in that. How do you feel about the philosophic quote that says everything happens for a reason? I believe it does happen for a reason. But I also believe that we have, you know, we create everything with our thoughts. We are the most amazing manifestors. Wanted or unwanted thoughts create our reality. So if we could be conscious of creating what we want with our thoughts, only what we want, we would be having the most glorious lives. So how can we choose our thoughts and direct them to create and manifest today? That's a possible. <laughs> and that's part of the whole reframing, right? Yes. So you've mentioned Abraham's foe. So give us a little bit more for the listener who do not know who Abraham Hicks is, and a, maybe a high level overview of the law of attraction or the manifestation process that Abraham teach. Can you give us a little bit of background on that for people? Yes. So uh, the, the work of Abraham and um, is Jerry and, and Esther Hicks, and they believe that our whole purpose is joy. And they also talk a lot about law of attraction, which is that we attract everything into our experience vibrationally through our thoughts and our feelings. So it's really an interesting concept when you wrap your mind around this because you can begin to understand how you can use the contrast. Contrast is everything that you're not wanting so that you're launching all of these rockets of desire. So you know what you don't want and then from there, you know what you do want. And how can you focus all of that attention on what you do want to create just that? The work is tremendously powerful because they continually offer the opportunity for you to create it for yourself. They don't put themselves on any kind of, they're not, you know, on any kind of a pedestal. Yeah, nothing like that. It's about, you know, you vibrationally, moment by moment, using the opportunity, knowing what you don't want to create what you do want. And how can you choose the better feeling thought to feel good? So you can get into this place called the vortex, where you're living this vibrationally very high life. And you attract in your life what you want. And that's the whole concept of changing our storyline to change our life is as we change the nature of our emotion and our energy, in part, we will attract what we want in life, correct? Yes, and it is my belief that the basis of every other relationship that we go on to have is a reflection of the relationship that we have with ourselves. Hmm. So the relationship that we create and recreate with ourselves moment by moment is the basis for every other relationship that we go on to have with another. The word self-love is very trendy today. Anyway, in the world that we hang out with in my community, there's a lot of buzz and energy put behind loving ourselves and having more self-love and self-love days and self-love challenges. How does that relate with our relationship with ourselves? Self-love mm -hmm. is to get to the place where you unconditionally accept yourself 
And not only do you accept yourself, you trust yourself. And you allow yourself to be guided from the inside, making choices for yourself. And when you are clear about what those choices are, it is amazing how you are then so able to allow others to make those choices for themselves. So we are unconditionally loving ourselves, and then we are extending ourselves with two hands and allowing other people without any judgment to make choices for themselves. And I believe that's really what self-love is. And when we are in a place where we are appreciating ourselves, where we're connected to ourselves, where we are loving ourselves, then we tend to spill over into and onto all others unconditionally. And to move about the world, creating these kinds of relationships with people, I mean, to me, that's amazing. And it is a true reflection of self-love. I love me and I love you. No matter what you're doing, no matter what you're saying, that's who you are and I love you for it. It doesn't mean I need to be a part of it, but when I look at you, I look at you through the eyes of source. No judgment. Mm -hmm. That's self-love. And I have to say this because I know a lot of people probably are being irritated right now and the irritation that you may feel is because it is a truth for you right now that you're hearing but self-love is very challenging for many women to achieve in part i think is because there's the judgment of our story we can't and i know i hear that a lot in in my programs in my group is how can i love myself the way that i am today so it It is really a wonderful thing if you are able to take where you are in this moment, whatever that story is, and change your relationship to the story. So the story stays the same, but you can create a different relationship with the story. You can make all kinds of editings and storylines, you can change it because you can see yourself in the story differently. That's a choice. Can you give us an example of that? You know, people talk a lot about their job, that, you know, that they feel that they're a slave to their job, that they're overworked, that they're underappreciated, that they're underpaid. And a lot of people are, are tied You know, their identity is tied into the work that they're doing or their job. Mm -hmm. So we ask people like, you know, could you start to see yourself in this job? Is it really an opportunity to know better what more you're wanting for yourself? Could you see being asked to stay late, working extra hours as an opportunity to understand that you're a really good worker and that there is a lot of appreciation for what you do and what you know. So how can we turn the situation upside down and look for the upside of it? Because at the end of the day, you're going to your job every day anyway. So you can choose to go and feel good about it, or you can choose to go and to just dig your heels in and to feel really bad about it and create this whole drama about nobody appreciates you, you're underpaid, you know, blah, 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 blah. We have a choice. You can create the story that feels good or the story that doesn't. And really, the job doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But how you feel about it and how you relate to it, that's what changes. That's brilliant. It's not about what we do. It's about how we feel about what we do, which is coming back to food. It's not about eating the food. It's about how do we feel before, during, and after we're eating the food. Are we punishing ourselves through food? Because that's a big one, right? We're going to cut back how much we eat because we've been a bad person over the weekend or this food is bad, so I'm going to take it out. We are using food as a way of, I guess, leveraging love and hate towards ourselves. Yes, but this is a choice. Mm -hmm. We must realize, and sometimes it's fine to say, I am choosing right now to eat this food. I know I'm doing this to myself. 
I know it's not going to make me feel better. I'm going to do it anyway. It's an old pattern. And if we would acknowledge that at the time it's happening, not to beat ourselves up, but to say, I'm taking personal responsibility. I'm going to eat this ice cream. I'm not going to feel good before I do it. I know I'm going to feel bad after I eat it. Then you're not a victim to the ice cream. You've made a choice. And there's power in making the choice, sitting down and making a conscious choice to eat something. But to feel good about it before, during, and after, that clearly is the better feeling choice. Absolutely. It's all about the intention behind, a.k.a. the ice cream, right? Are yes. you doing it completely unconsciously? Are you doing it from a place of love? Are you doing it from a place of hate, a place of numbing? What's your intention behind that bowl of ice cream? Yes. And so to acknowledge that with loving curiosity, not with judgment. There's nothing to be judgmental about. It's not a big deal. You know, then you have the next moment to make the next choice and the next moment and the next. So our relationship with our food is a direct reflection of our relationship with ourselves. May I ask us to dig into, because you, you gave some good coaching around work, the other big self-love roadblock that many women experience is their relationship to their body. And I hear this a lot and I've lived it myself as well. If I accept myself the way that I am today, which is overweight, then that will lead me to eat more. There's nothing to be loved about my body today. How would you reframe that? Okay. So if we could start to think about how we want our body to look, how we want to feel in our body, that would be really helpful because if we can see it, if we can see ourselves in a better feeling place in our body, we can create it. But if you can't see it, you can't create it. So to be able to really look at a, maybe, you know, a pair of jeans that you wore a year ago and to pull them out and say, wow, I remember how good that felt to fit into these jeans. And I think that I can fit into these jeans again. And just so you kind of go back and you take yourself to a place and time that felt really good when you were in your body and you felt good in your body and to stay there because If you can stay in that headspace of feeling good in your body from a year ago or 10 years or whatever, you can recreate it in your body today. Your relationship with everything will start to shift. That's called the law of attraction. That is called the law of attraction. <laughs> But And for most of us, we do have a time where we remember feeling so good in our body, mm -hmm. even if it's when we were a child. So I say go back and milk that for all it's worth. You know, recreate that in your mind over and over and over again. Visualize about it. Reflect on it. And you are absolutely have the power to recreate it in your now. That is, I think, a big part of what's missing is that instead of focusing on how good it feels, we're focusing on the opposite of how miserable we feel currently. And that recreates where we are today. It recreates that vicious circle. Right. Well, it creates more misery because if you focus on the misery, you get more misery. But if you focus on the good feeling, even if it's, you feel good for one moment in your body, in your day, focus on that, you will get more of that. What you focus on is what you get, wanted or unwanted. So we must discipline our mind. Our mind runs our body, truly. How do we go about disciplining our mind? What is your path? Laughter. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Because you start to catch yourself, you know, what you're thinking about. And the minute you catch yourself, you can laugh about it and then you can shift, mm -hmm. you know. So it's a way to create consciousness with levity and it's kind of fun to do because you're laughing pretty much all day long with yourself and you're making these little edits, you know, so you catch yourself like putting yourself down or glancing in the mirror and saying something negative and you just have to laugh about it. And then it's a nice reminder to say, okay, what can I look for a spirit of appreciation about myself today? 
And how good does that feel? And how long can I stay in that thought? And the longer you stay in the thought, then the more thoughts you create. And it kind of builds momentum. And it starts to feel good. The laughter feels good. The shifting feels good. The looking for other things to appreciate about yourself and other people feels good. And then the process starts to feel good. And then you laugh more. Yes. And then you (laughs) laugh more. And then you laugh more. And I have to say, it's hard to eat while you're laughing. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So I am laughing all day long. But I also spend a lot of time eating with my eyes. Mm -hmm. So I look at food. I appreciate food. I can see it. I can taste it in my mouth without even eating it. I take myself through the entire process. And then when I'm all done with it, I ask myself, do I even want this? And most of the time, I've already had it. So I don't really want it. So it's kind of a running joke in my family because I am always looking at like pastries and all kinds of food. And by the end of it, you know, I'll have maybe a few bites, but I'm so full because I have literally just steeped myself in the appreciation of it all through all of my senses. That's amazing. So a lot of laughter to discipline our mind. Yes. Lots of it. Yes. (laughs) Lots of self-awareness, right? So we can catch our thoughts. Yes. Not being non-judgmental, but lovingly curious. Yes. Yes. Is there a practice that beyond being self-aware and laughter that you would recommend to people to master our thoughts at a higher level? Well, I think if we could sit with ourselves the first few minutes of the day and address ourselves and really feel appreciation for ourselves where we are in this moment, that that's a great way to start the day. And instead of like most people jump out of bed and they run and they take care of their families and they take care of everyone else. And then they're so resentful by the end of the day that none of it feels good to them. It doesn't feel good to their families. It doesn't feel good to them. It's just they have had nothing really to give to begin with and now they're completely empty. And then they sit down and then they they eat. (laughs) And then they feel worse. And then they feel worse. So sit with yourself. And I also must say that women tend to hide behind their roles of being caretakers and partners so that they never need to address themselves. So I ask you, please sit with yourself first few minutes of the day with a cup of coffee, with whatever, and just address yourself, which means appreciate yourself. Have a little quiet time for yourself. It really gives ourselves the message that we're important, that we matter. That is an act of self-love. It absolutely is. And when we love ourselves, we love everybody. So if you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for other people. It doesn't matter how you start this process or why you start this process, but certainly have fun with it if you're going to do any of this. None of this should feel hard. It shouldn't feel like work. It shouldn't feel restrictive. It just shouldn't. So we start from a place of observing and being present with ourselves for a few minutes in the morning. It could be as simple as that. And then laughter throughout the day when we observe our thoughts and how they're really not our thoughts. Exactly. It doesn't take long. It takes 30 days to change a habit. That's it. Mm -hmm. 30 days. That's a month. Month goes by really fast. But if you're having fun along the way doing it, then it goes by even faster. So it's about shifting. How can we shift moment by moment? Exactly. And that is part of the book that you've recently released and you've written with the intention of helping people to complete this process? Well, to recreate Mm -hmm. the long-term connected relationship with themselves. Because I think it's every single moment. You know, every moment we're in judgment, we're disconnected from ourselves. Every single moment. So as soon as you realize you're disconnected because you're judging yourself or someone else, Laugh about it. The laughter will connect you instantly. 
So the book title is The Ever-Loving Essence of You, and I've put in the show notes for those interested into the book, you are actually providing people with a sample of the book in the, I think it's the Alignment chapter. Mm -hmm. You guys can click the link in the show notes and then you'll be able to get your Alignment chapter. Now you also have a practice where you work with people one-on-one to help them through this process in a completely different perspective than most other coach. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yes. So I assist people in assisting themselves. And the way that I like to do it is to ask people to begin to trust themselves and to tell me how much time that they need for a session when we're working together. Because I believe that everybody knows best for themselves. I truly believe that we are our own greatest resources and no one would know better for you than you. So people buy a block of time and then when they're ready for a session, they reach out to me and they decide how much time they wanna use in a particular session. And I think that that really helps people trust themselves redirect themselves inward, ask themselves the question, how much time am I needing to work on something today and wait for the answer. Then I also have this lovely texting option, which is really great because people are so busy and sometimes they just need a little guidance. So they purchase time for texting. They text me a question and then by the time they're done texting me, They've already in some ways answered their own question, but then I text them back. So it really is a way for people to tap into themselves through tapping into me. And once again, it reinforces that you do know for yourself. So at the end of the day, you do know for yourself, whether you don't know how or why, you know, and whether you're listening to yourself or not, that's whole other question because your inner being is tapping you on the shoulder 24 hours a day trying to get your attention and guiding you to your higher self and most of us are just like oh I don't have time right now go away I can't deal with this we're not choosing to tune in to those messages that we're continually getting that would direct us to our higher self so when you quiet the mind you'll hear those messages. You'll feel those messages. And hopefully, you'll allow yourself to trust them. I think it's absolutely brilliant the way you're formatted your work with people because it's empowering. So kudos to you. But also in your approach as a psychotherapist in which you're not looking back, doing traditional talk therapy, but you're actually moving people forward by tapping into their intuition so they can make different choices instead of analyzing the backstory for weeks and months and years trying to find a solution. I don't think that that works. I really don't. And I think that if we want to revisit something that happened back then, to look at it for a few moments is fine. But I don't think you need to look back in order to move forward. And by tapping into your own, call it intuition, that will give you the path to move forward to to create that new story, that new self, by tapping into the answer that's already inside of you. Exactly. And most of us know that it's there. I have never heard anyone say, I should not have listened to myself. But I hear people all the time say, I should have listened to myself. Because people get an inkling, they get a, you know, a signal and they don't listen to themselves until after the fact. And then they think, oh my goodness, like I knew that, but Mm -hmm. I didn't listen to myself. And you know what? That's okay. But acknowledge it, at least acknowledge that you knew. And then you could acknowledge that you chose not to listen. You weren't a victim. You made a choice, a conscious choice. I know I'm supposed to do something differently and I'm choosing not to do it and there's a lot of power in that totally and for many of us when we begin to develop that 
level of awareness to self, to intuition, to the higher power, whatever you call it inside of us, it's scary. Or it's familiar. Oh. And I think that in some ways, it is all too familiar. And we don't know what to do with it. It is like coming home. It really is. And I don't think that there are enough external sources that encourage us to look in, trust ourselves, guide ourselves, and go there. There's nothing outside of ourselves. There really isn't. There's nothing out there. It's all inside. But I think, and without placing judgment, but I think you mentioned that earlier in the interview, society is built in a way to encourage us to look outside of us. There's very little sources that encourage us to look inside. But if we stop yeah. and we allow ourselves to feel for what resonates with us, like selectively sift, instead of just going with the messages that society is putting out there, we would make choices based on how we felt yes. about what was going on out there. I just posted something on social media a couple of days ago about that, about cleaning up our feed. Yeah, that's right. Because many of us are on Facebook or Instagram or whatever social media you are in, and we're allowing this feed to literally feed our mind of concepts that do not benefit us. Well, that do not resonate with us. Because, yes. you know, if you could stop and ask yourself, like, does this feel good? Does this make sense? Is this something that I'm enjoying reading? You know, once again, it's about consciously interacting with social media based on what feels good to you without judgment. Because what feels good to you, just scroll down. But you don't have to judge it. The minute you judge it, you're disconnected from yourself. So... Can you not agree with something without judging it? Of course. It's just not for you. Move along. It doesn't make it bad or wrong. It's just not for you. I'll add to the show notes because I think it's very important that we have, for those of us that are on social media, spaces in which that we can have positive reinforcement. So I'll add to the show note Abraham Hicks as a source yes. of this information. Yeah, there's so many YouTube videos. I mean, it's, it's such wonderful work. Well, I thank you very much, Jamie, for having been with us today. Thank you. Really yeah. appreciated your time. And all the information we talked about will be in the show notes at stephaniedozi.com. And I look forward to having you maybe again on the show later. Thank you very much. Be well. Thank you. There you have it. Did you enjoy it? Did you learn something? Are you ready to help me share this message with more women to help us move beyond the food and beyond a traditional resolution setting? If so, there's a few things you can do for me right now. Number one, you can share the show note directly from your listening device right now, either by using the software of the listening device or by going to my website at stephaniedozy.com slash 111 and share the show notes via email, Facebook, Instagram, tag me in your post, and you'll see I will respond to you and tell me what you've learned in the content of the show and how it helped you and how you think it can help other women in your life. You can also leave me a review right there. If you have an iPhone, you can just click review in your podcast app and leave me a review, and it's fuel for me. It gives me energy to keep going. So, what is next? Episode 112 is with Dr. Deanna Minich. And we're going to talk about energy centers in our body, commonly known as chakras. You may have heard me talk about chakras before, but I never actually deep dive into it yet. And it's going to happen in the next show. It is something that I use all the time in my private practice with my patient, but I have yet to find a way of explaining it on a podcast. And Dr. Deanna Minich with her new book is doing just that. So I hope to see you then. And again, I'm glad that you stuck with me till the end and with Jamie as well. And I love you. We'll see you on the next show. <music>